I really don't know the answers. I'm just not sure we will ever know. What do you mean no one knows? Well, why not? Tell me. Tell me they have figured it out. Why? Who? Oh my God, this is so frustrating. Welcome to Extraordinary Stories Podcast. Hey, how are you? Are you well? Are you good? I am. Except you may be able to hear, or definitely will be able to hear, I'm having voice issues. Thanks to everyone who's been like, Barry, where are you? Barry, are you dead? What's happening? Basically, I'm in full fighting fit health. But my voice, a few days ago, just disappeared. I woke up and basically I was whispery man. That's who I was. The most I could manage was, Gather round, I'm going to tell you a story. And then I thought, a whole episode of that, it's nothing short of creepy. (laughs) So... I'll do my best. Stick with me. Okay, let's start with shout outs. And on that note, because I I was away on holiday, I've not been my usual responsive self. I normally get back to every message, email, tweet, Instagram, carrier pigeon, whatever way you get in touch instantly. But that just wasn't possible. So if you didn't hear from me, I'm sorry, you will, I promise. Okay, shout outs to Julia Dryland. Thank you for the story that you sent me, Julia. But also to Julia Dryland's sister, Catherine Walsh, who I believe, if I've worked this out correctly, should be having her birthday today. So happy birthday, Catherine. I think it's today. I think it's the 30th. Ryan Rogers, your Isadora Duncan feedback was gorgeous. Thanks for getting in touch. Matt and Joe Elliott. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Joe, for listening to the stories. Hannah Gabriel and Adam Powis. Thanks, you gorgeous couple, for your post on Facebook and for getting in touch. Hannah calls Adam Pow Bear. So when she said that, she didn't explain why. Now, <laughs> this is where you'll discover I'm I'm no Hercules Poirot. I was looking at that and going, why would he be called Pow Bear? And I was thinking of, is it like, you know, like the old, like, cartoons we'd have the speech bubble and it would be like pow like that i was like mm, is, mm, i'm not sure if it's that then my mind went to this which is a really random tangent but i have a friend and i genuinely this is not one of these i have a friend but it's really me i genuinely i have a friend called david whose girlfriend's biggest annoyance in the world is that once they've had sex (laughs) he high fives her and says pow (laughs) but then I was like well no I think that's specific to them I don't think people just do that then I looked at it again and I was like oh for fuck's sake Barry you idiot his surname is spelled P-O-W-I-S oh my god yeah 
clearly Poirot, I am not. So, hello to Hannah and Adam, who collectively describe themselves as Shrek and Fiona, a Scottish ogre and a burpee princess. Hello to John Hanan, thanks for the link to the story, and I'm definitely going to cover that one. John, thank you. Chelsea in Western Australia, who listens with her boyfriend, hello. And lastly, Janet Leonard and Susan Docker, hello. Now, Francesca Leonard gave me the kick up the arse that I needed to remember this one. I've said it before, don't be shy to ask for a shout out and don't be shy to say to me, Oi, I asked for a shout out, where is it? Okay. On with the episode. Okay, this episode, we are wandering into an area I don't often wander into. Unsolved crimes. Why? Well, I asked myself the question. And really, it's quite simple. I like a really well-rounded story. I like it to be complete. I like a beginning, a middle and an end. Even if the ending is frustrating, it doesn't matter. But for this episode, I put that aside. Because, well, as I often do, I started down this line of inquiry, I went down a hole, and I found myself at one story, the first one, a strange tale. And then it reminded me of a story from Scotland that I heard on the news a couple of years ago. And I kind of just worked from there. So I'm going to work both geographically and with time in order. We will start with, we've got three stories. We're going to start with the furthest away from me and the furthest in time. And we'll work to the present day. So we're spanning the decades, continents. And I'll be telling three very peculiar dark stories. Are you ready? Okay. Let's go. Story one, the Ryan siblings. Story one starts in New York in 1873. And the main players in this story are brother and sister, Nicholas and Mary Ryan. A brother and a sister fairly close in age, with Nicholas being only a year older than Mary. Nicholas was 28 and Mary 27. Now they were both born in New York and they worked in New York. Their parents were dead and from a young age both kids had relied heavily on each other. As siblings go, it's said that Nicholas and Mary were very close. Very close indeed. People who would see them every day, right, they would comment that in some ways the brother and sister, they could almost be mistaken for a young couple. There were two sisters who knew the siblings and they lived in the same apartment block. Um, From now on, we're going to call them Gossiping Greta and Nosy Nancy. Okay. So, I mean, really, that relationship between Nicholas and Mary, what are we talking about? Possibly incest. Well, only possibly. It's a it's a tough thing to prove. Perhaps they were just close in the way that some siblings are. I mean, it doesn't always mean you're bumping uglies. When you're close, you could just be really good friends. So where did they live? Well, they shared a single room in a tenement building in Brooklyn. In this room, they had one bed and one mattress. Nicholas slept on the bed, while Mary 
slept on the mattress on the floor. Not very uh, gentlemanly of you there, Nicholas. You really should have given the bed to your sister. Anyway, the two of them, as well as I, I said, were very close. They did date other people. Nicholas, not for any length of time. He was more of a love him and leave him kind of guy, if you know what I mean. <laughs> I just winked when I said that. <laughs> Who the fuck am I winking at? <laughs> My microphone, apparently. I think I think I was winking at you when I did that. Anyway. So, yeah. He didn't really have a serious relationship. But Mary did. She had a boyfriend. And let me tell you this, no matter how many hours of research I did, could I find Mary's boyfriend's name? Eh, no, could I fuck? Couldn't find it anywhere. So for the sake of ease, we're going to call him Mr. B, as in B for boyfriend. (laughs) So Mary is dating Mr. B. She's living with Nicholas in their one room and things are about to change in their lives. Mary discovers that she is pregnant. Now, talking to gossiping Greta and nosy Nancy, Mary discloses that she's pregnant. And of course, the question that's Whispered is, who's the father? Is it her boyfriend, Mr. B? Or is it her brother, Nicholas? Hmm. Interesting. But not as interesting as what's about to happen next. On the morning of October 13th, 1873, A neighbour who lived above the pair was leaving for work when he discovered a trail of blood leading from Nicholas and Mary's front door through the landing of the tenement building. On the second floor landing, one up from where they lived, lay the dead body of Nicholas. His throat had been cut open. In their apartment downstairs on the mattress which Mary slept on, her dead body was found. She had been strangled and just like her brother, her throat had been cut open. The trail of blood found by the neighbour. It was investigated straight away by NYPD as soon as they got to the tenement. And they discovered that it led from their apartment up to the roof of the building, and that's where it stopped. A knife was discovered near Mary's body, but here's the thing. There was not one single drop of blood on the knife. Not one. So where was the murder weapon. Well, nowhere to be found. Had the killer gone up to the roof to throw the weapon off? Did that explain the trail of bloody footsteps? Hmm, possibly. So interviews with neighbours, locals and anyone police thought could be useful, were conducted. And this no doubt included gossiping Greta and nosy Nancy. And from this, without a witness, without a weapon, and without a motive, police drew the two following conclusions. Either A, Mary's boyfriend, Mr. B had been so enraged 
at her pregnancy. But, you know, because in those days, you'd need to marry a girl if you got her pregnant. Do the right thing. That he had, perhaps Mr B had snuck in in the night, killed Mary, and in the process woken up Nicholas, who'd chased him out into the landing where Mr B had killed Nicholas on the second floor. Which would explain why Nicholas's body was there. It would also explain the bloody footprints. Hmm, it sounds like not a bad theory. Now, did they track down Mr B? Well, no. Because they couldn't get a good enough level of clarity about what he looked like, where he lived, what age he was, any of that. The second theory, and this is the one that I think people would like to be true, just to make the story more exciting, is that the baby Mary was carrying didn't belong to Mr B, it in fact belonged to her brother. And that realising the gravity of this, having gotten your sister pregnant, Nicholas snapped, kills Mary, takes himself from the apartment and kills himself on the landing. Now there's more holes in the second theory for me. Although, if they were an incestuous pair of siblings, I wouldn't rule out that the baby could be his. A few weeks after the double murder, police were winding down the investigation and carrying out any final interviews. When they interviewed a local liquor store worker who remembered that on the evening the murders had taken place, a man had come in to the shop with blood splattered up his arms and down his hands and he was very agitated. He ordered a bottle of whiskey and he left. Despite a strong description from the worker, the man was never found. And the murders of Nicholas and Mary Ryan would never be solved. And so ends story one, The Ryan Siblings. Story two moves us forward in time and takes us to England in 1913. This is, I'm not kidding, a mystery that honestly sounds like it's from an Agatha Christie novel, but sadly it's not, it's real. Story two, the chess death. William and Julia Wallace lived in Liverpool, England. Now, they were a fairly average couple. William was an insurance broker. So, you know, he made an okay salary for the time. They lived in a nice Victorian house in Wolverhampton Road in Liverpool. They'd married young, but they had never had any children. William, who was 53, is described rather (laughs) unflatteringly (laughs) as an out of shape and red in the face, quiet man, and his wife, dowdy. (laughs) Julie would make corsets and clothing from bits of old clothing. Right, here's a request. If I die in a horrific murder. I mean, obviously, I would want the story to be fabulous. And I'd want other podcasters to be like, oh my God, I want to tell Barry's story. But please, please, I'm asking you, and anyone listening, don't let me go down in print in such a negative way. I mean, obviously, I'm not an insurance broker in 1913, but you know what I mean. I want nice pictures in the paper. I want my 
Wikipedia page. Not that I have one, but I want one about my murder. I want it edited to include lots of exciting and ridiculous information that, you know, I don't know. Let's say I had a secret love of racehorses and that I could speak eight languages. I was an expert tap dancer, none of which is true. But then in the future, that's hard to prove, okay? I don't really want to go down as out of shape and red in the face or dowdy. So the out of shape, red in the face William, he liked to go weekly and play a game of chess at the local gentleman's club he visited. And it wasn't far from their house. And so one Monday evening in January 1931, off he goes, kissing his wife goodbye as he leaves. When he gets to the club, he is settling into his game of chess. You know, knight to pawn, queen to castle, that sort of carry on. I don't play chess, which is probably quite evident from that description. So William's really into his game when he's interrupted by a staff member who approaches him to say there had been a call for him to the club earlier, half an hour before he arrived. Now he thinks, hmm, this has to have been someone from work trying to reach him. But no, the call was from a Mr R. M. Qualtro. A name not familiar with him. Business, maybe? A new insurance client, perhaps? William wasn't sure. Now, the caller had left a message telling William to go to an address the following evening in another part of Liverpool and to arrive there for 7.30. He was to go to Menlove Gardens East. How odd, he thinks. How very strange. I mean, I know times are different, but if I got that message, I'd be like, I write, mate, whatever. <laughs> Sounds dodgy as fuck. So he gets home. He tells Julie and she agrees. This is odd. Why would someone leave this message? Anyway, the following night, he leaves work and he goes to find the address. Men Love Gardens East. He takes two trams and he walks to where he thinks it is. And for an hour, he walks up and down. And for the life of him, he can't find this address. He can find Men Love Gardens North, South, West, East. East does not exist. The address was completely made up. Reminds me of the fact that... <laughs> I, I remember learning this a few years ago and being really shocked. There is no North by Northwest. Alfred Hitchcock just made that up. Just made it up. <laughs> it doesn't exist. If you don't believe me, look it up. It doesn't exist. So much like this address. <laughs> so William is furious and quite rightly, his time has been wasted and also he's got no idea why. I'd be really confused if I was him. So he gets home and his neighbours happen to be arriving home at the same time as him. They will say that William was agitated. He was irritable. Well, you would be. You've just had all your time wasted. He can't seem to get the keys working in the front door and he says the bloody thing won't open. Or if he was from Liverpool, that would be the bloody thing won't open. No, that's not Liverpool. <laughs> what the hell was that? The 
Oh, anyway, I can't. I clearly can't do a Liverpool accent. So the neighbours they go into their house, only to find William knocking on their door, minutes later, shouting, "Come quickly, she's dead." By she, he meant his wife, Julie. Julie had been beaten to death in the couple's living room and lay dead on the rug. Blood covered her face. Her body, the walls, blood had even hit the ceiling. And it, that just shows you how, oh, how violent that attack was. Fuck that poor, poor, poor woman. I mean, it's not nice to talk about, but beating someone to death is horrific. I mean, there's no good way. I've said this before. There's no good way to murder someone. But at least a gunshot is quick. To be beaten to death, it's just brutal. God bless Julie in those last moments. And poor William, who had to come home to that site. He was a mess. He was an absolute mess. He was shaking and he was barely making sense. Within half an hour, the police, the press, the neighbours and locals were outside the property, shocked by the death and desperate to know what had happened. Now this next bit, I love Will. Not love, but it'll certainly remind you that we're in 1913. The chief police inspector arrives drunk at the scene. How, how very 1913 of him. I think you could do almost every job with a drink in you. And when he comes inside the property, he falls over the coroner. So drunk, he falls over the coroner who's examining Julie's body. For fuck's sake. It's gone from, it's gone from Agatha Christie to some ridiculous farce. But that ridiculous image aside, the scene was grim. The murder of Julie Wallace was one of the most violent in England at that time. Upon inspection, police found underneath Julie's body a Macintosh jacket. Do you know what I mean when I say Macintosh jacket? The long Mac, the classic flasher jacket. (laughs) And it was covered in her blood. Who did the jacket belong to? It belonged to her husband, William. Aside from the jacket underneath her, she wore only a corset. No signs of sexual abuse could be found on her body. So police are baffled for two weeks. Who would do this? Why would anyone beat this housewife so violently to death? Then they start to put together the following things. The mysterious call to William, telling him to go to the fake address. The neighbours seeing him agitated. The Macintosh under her body that belonged to him. And they arrive at the conclusion that it had to be William who was responsible for the murder. They put together the following theory. They say this is how it went. William returned home from work that day. He put on his Macintosh coat and he beat 
his wife to death. He then took the jacket off. It was covered in her blood and it meant that none of his clothes underneath were splattered with blood. He then goes out of the house to find the mysterious address and he returns home and fakes his shock at finding her. Some people think that sounds really plausible. Mm. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But then police discover one more thing. And this does change everything. The call that was made to the club. The mysterious message. It was made from a call box only metres away from the chess club. On the evening that he was passing that phone box. So it's entirely feasible that he made that call himself. That he essentially called ahead, left himself a fake message, therefore giving himself an alibi. So if we just take stock, police are saying William has staged this whole thing start to finish and he is arrested for the murder of his wife. The case goes to court and the circumstantial evidence, the stuff I just took you through, the Macintosh, the message, it's dragged out in court. A jury deliberate for four days and they find William guilty. And he is sentenced to life in prison. Is this where it ends? Well, of course not. I told you in the beginning, this week was unsolved crimes. William appeals, and eventually his appeal is heard by, get this, the High Court of Criminal Appeal. And it's the first time that had ever happened in the UK. They hear William's case, they look at all the police evidence, they decide everything is circumstantial and the conviction is thrown out. William is made a free man. A free man, but a broken man. William only lived another few years after the death of Julie. And in his grief, he died. No person has ever been found guilty of this murder. And to this day, it still remains so baffling. Detectives, even now, in 2018, criminologists will say this has got to remain one of the biggest UK murder mysteries. And so ends story two, the chess death. Okay, well, what do you make of that? Let me know. Answers on a postcard, please. Okay, story three and the final story. The envelope. Story three brings us right up to 2004 and it's the closest to me in terms of location. It takes place in... Scotland, in a place called Nairn. Now, here's my advice. Here's my top tip. Tourist guides will tell you, if you're coming to Scotland, visit Loch Lomond, visit the Cairngorms, 
visit Edinburgh. All of which you should do. But if you're ever in Scotland and you've ever got a day to spare, go and visit Nairn. Nairn is beautiful. It's just so gorgeous. You can see the Scottish hills, the water, nature. It's just a beautiful example of rural Scotland. It's a bit of a trek like for me to get to from Glasgow, but it is well worth seeing. Anyway, we go to 2004 and we're dealing with an unsolved case that is just so bizarre. Alistair Wilson is a young father with two sons and he and his wife Veronica, they're living in Nairn. Alistair worked in banking. Veronica was a stay-at-home mum who looked after their two babies, their two sons. The family had just enjoyed spending the whole weekend together and now it was Sunday night. Alistair would be due back at work on the Monday morning. Now it's time for both the boys to be put to bed. So Alistair, Veronica, they're upstairs, they're putting the boys to bed when there is a knock at their front door. Odd, they think. Who would be calling at their door on a Sunday night at seven o'clock? Veronica says that she will go down and answer it. When she gets downstairs, she opens the door and there's a man standing on the doorstep. The guy is aged maybe 35 to 40, clean shaven, and wearing a baseball cap. The man asks if he can speak with Alistair Wilson. Now, she's confused. She's not sure who this guy is. She goes upstairs and she tells Alistair, there's a man downstairs asking for you. So he goes, okay, well, I've no idea who that could be, but I'll go down. So he goes downstairs, he greets the man, and the man hands him a blue envelope. The blue envelope has the name Paul written on it. Paul. P-A-U-L. Paul. Who's Paul? There's nothing inside the envelope. So Alistair closes the door, he goes back upstairs to his wife and his kids, and he explains the weird envelope that he's just received. Veronica says he definitely asked for you by name. He asked for Alistair Wilson. So they think, right, okay, here's what we'll do. We'll put the kids down. And then we'll go downstairs, we'll sit, and we'll have a think about this weird envelope you received. Alistair says, okay, but I just want to go back down and check if he's still there. Veronica says, okay, on you go. So Alistair goes downstairs, and minutes later... Veronica hears three gunshots. Alistair has been shot three times and is lying dead on his doorstep. Veronica calls the police and she is screaming for help. She runs across the road to the pub. She bursts into the pub. She's hysterical. Twelve people from the pub rush out and they try and save Alistair there on the doorstep. On the way to hospital, Alistair Wilson dies. So, the town of Nairn is in shock. The story makes no sense. The death of a man who had no enemies, is a mystery. 
60 police officers are immediately assigned to the case and the investigation begins. Days later, the weapon, the gun used to kill him, is found down a drain not far from the scene of the murder. And here's what's odd. This was a really rare gun. Forgive my pronunciation. The Heinel Schnesser. <laughs> that can't be right. The Heinel Schnesser. It was a, a rare German handgun. And there were only ever eight of them in the whole of the UK. Here's what's weirder. A year before Alistair's death, there had been a house clearance in Nairn and during that house clearance, a Heinel Schneiser had been found and had been handed to police. So how, when this gun is A, rare, and B, there are only eight in the whole of the UK, how did two of them end up in this one little out of the way village in Scotland, in rural Scotland? It's just another bit of the mystery that's so baffling. Alistair was buried and his family had the chance to put him to rest. But really, I mean, what's what's not at rest is why? Or who? The most the most kind of common theory I think is mistaken identity. Was he the wrong Alistair Wilson? Or people wonder is there possibly a connection to his job in a bank? Years on, none of these leads have led police anywhere. However, the case is still ongoing. And so ends story three, The Envelope. Okay, well, I hope you enjoyed those. I think they're three of the weirdest, yet fascinating and devastating mysteries I've come across. Okay. So all that I've got left to say is the usual. Get me on social media. Join the Facebook group. Find me on Twitter, Instagram. Wherever you are, wherever you listen, if you can leave me a review, please do so. That would be lovely. I'm on Patreon. And for all you who listen regularly, Thank you for being patient while my voice is a bit broken. Okay? I'm out of here. Okay? Goodbye. It didn't, it didn't affect me really one way or the other. <laughs> <laughs>